Hello and good day. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thanks to Emily, who's working upstairs at the desk to uh, help put this uh, technological connection together uh, so that we can continue uh, Brown Bag and Books program sponsored by Harrisburg District Library and the Friends of the Library. I'm pleased to be back this January for either the 25th or 26th consecutive year. That's hard to imagine. Um, so these are unusual times as we are relatively shuttered since our COVID infection. And what better time, uh, maybe no more perfect time, than to uh, review a travel log that gets us not only outside of our, our living rooms and our homes, but gets us outside of our state and our region and outside of our times to another one. Uh, so, uh, you know, to paraphrase William Shakespeare's 116th sonnet, let us not admit, uh, let us not to the marriage of true minds admit infections. Um, and so by this connection, uh, we are made one. So thank you all again uh, for your help in connecting us and helping me to connect with you. We stood long enough near the bow of the Osage for sundown, as the Americans call it, to come and hang above a long blur of thinning alto cumuli, gradually smudging the sun into an observable disk, atmospherically magnified to disperse over the sky a flagrant radiance one might expect at the first or final sunshine on an earth ready for either impending glory or disintegration alpha or omega i ask my colleague deems which he saw and he said every sunset is somewhere somebody's sunshine sunrise when the disc began vanishing at the shut of day i heard him murmur Oh, America. Now, as I write this, I am trying to hear his tenor. Maybe what he said was, Oh, America. Was it belief in citizens fulfilling the promise of the land? Or was it a premonition no people could ever fulfill a covenant with such a munificent land? The title of our book under review for today comes from this very passage on page 259 in the hardback copy of O oh America by William Least Heat Moon. It is a discovery in a new land, um, a travelogue from the eastern shores of America into the upper Great Plains. Written by William Least Heat Moon, who is arguably our best living American travelogue writer. It is a literary tour de force, an impressive performance, um, an achievement, a feat that has been accomplished and managed with great skill. As a historical novel, it is an impressive achievement and a performance. But as a travelogue, it is a genuine, accomplished and complete tour that is written and managed with great skill and courage by the characters involved. William Least Heat Moon, our author for today, is no stranger to us, nor is America a stranger to him. He is a traveler of America and a prolific writer of those travels. We know him from previous works, first Blue Highways, then Prairie Earth, a deep map, River Horse, a voyage across America, Roads to Quaz, An American Mosey, and then a collection of short stories here, there, elsewhere, stories from the road. He is an American traveler. O oh, America is his second novel following Celestial Mechanics, 
a metaphysical love story, so to speak, which I've also read and thoroughly enjoyed. Lee Steet Moon was born William Trogdon. He is a former professor of English at the University of Missouri in our neighboring Columbia, Missouri. He's also a member of the Osage Nation, a tribe whose culture figures significantly in the last half of this book. The structure of O America is a journal basically in two parts, recorded by the fictional Dr. Nathaniel Trinit, a London physician. After an enlightening public lecture attended by a New England captain named Eben Finn, Dr. Trinit is invited by Captain Finn to join him as the ship's physician on a voyage from Plymouth Harbor to America. And he agrees. But before arriving initially in New York, he decides not to return to England on the Norway O packet, but to tour America from there. In Baltimore, where he eventually disembarks, he aids and abets the escape of a runaway slave named Nicodemus Cuff, or nicknamed Deems. Deems becomes Dr. Trennett's travel companion, and because he was modestly educated on the plantation which he was raised in Loudoun County, Virginia, by the mistress of the plantation, he also is an astute observer of medical matters and the environment and the surroundings through which he travels. He also has insights of his own, and so he becomes Dr. Trennett's medical assistant along the way, reading Dr. Trennett's medical books, which he's brought uh, for the journey. That least heat moon names the initial character captain, Finn, should signify to us, the reader, that this is a travelogue of great American significance with historical precedent. It is a travelogue of both white and black participants. And this book aspires to Twain in a way that at least succeeds, if not in breadth and depth, exceeds. No diminishment of Twain intended. Dr. Trennant asks Deems along the way, what if, as a requirement of American citizenship, a white and a black who share some interests must travel the country as we do now, the purpose not to gain self-knowledge, but to earn another's knowledge? Would abolition then be possible? Deems said, if at the start the hearts are open and true, then I think, yes, it's possible. If not, then I say there could be a slit throat. But to answer accurately, you need tell me the percentage of true hearts to bad ones. Mama used to call a ramble like this a get-along. She'd say, you gots to get along with each other, to get on along. It had application beyond footwork. Our novel for today is also a love story. Dr. Trennett on the Narwhal packet uh, required the help of an interpreter to communicate with uh, the German and the Polish immigrants on board in steerage. And so he found Zofia, who became his uh, interpreter and something of his assistant in working with those immigrant populations. Though Zofia fell ill with a, a, a high fever, uh, she recovered with Dr. Tennant's treatments and developed an either further interest, not only in his care for the entire uh, 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 the crew and, and the passengers, but to help relate to the, to the immigrant population. Over time, it's inevitable that Zofia 
and Dr. Trennett become attracted to each other in modestly expressed ways and terms. Uh, the doctor, before leaving the ship, had given Zofia a note of thanks for her help. Citing and alluding to his own growing affections, Shakespeare's sonnet 116. At the disembarkment in Baltimore, they were separated and temporarily lost from each other and appeared not to be able to say goodbye. And then, I saw a woman, her face obscured by a large bonnet, walking briskly towards me the low sun in my eyes, making it seem she was emerging from the sun itself. She drew back the bonnet and spoke. I was nearly swept away, the confusion. I embraced Sophie and she me, and I stood wordless until my composure returned. I pulled out my pocket memorandum and asked how to reach her in Buffalo, to which she was going. As she wrote in the address, she said, Sonnet 116, and whispered, Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. My joy deprived me of my speech. She was about to say something else when her brother barged forward, seized her arm, and tugged at her. She resisted long enough to say, What is impediments? Watching her disappearing into the throng, I shouted, Miles! I don't believe she heard me add, Let us not admit Miles! And she was gone. Zofia, or as she renames herself on the American shore, Sophie, settles in Buffalo, New York as a nanny and teacher to a prominent family's children. Dr. Trennant and Deems, after leaving their pack at Narwhale in Baltimore Harbor, by coach and on horseback cross the Mason-Dixon line on to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then into Lancaster County. Uh, to reunite with some Mennonites there who had sailed with them on him on the Narwhal. From there they journey across the Alleghenies on horseback, then also by stage uh, northeast through, to, uh, through northeast Pennsylvania and then through northern New Jersey and on to the Hudson River. This area is uh, an area I have traveled numerous times having been educated not far from one of the towns they stayed in in northern New Jersey. And so I could actually see the landscape and feel some of the territory they were driving through, at, riding through as I was reading it. Uh, their final destination will be Buffalo via Albany, New York and the Hudson River and then the Erie Canal, the Mohawk River. And then before embarking down the Ohio River to the Old Northwest Territories, Dr. Trennett and Sophie reunite in Buffalo for a few days. In these steps of the discovery of the new land, Dr. Trennett, unlike European visitors and writers before him, namely, as he cites in his book, in the book, as Lee Steep Moon cites in the book, Mrs. Francis Trollope, Charles Dickens, and Alexis de Tocqueville, Dr. Trennett intends two distinct aims, which I will describe from his journal. First, on travel itself. A traveler can measure a journey in miles, or the measure can be done differently. Instead of an odometer gauging linear distance, with a what about an odograph that gives a reading not in mileage or even in footsteps, but in experiences? A calculation not of leagues or length, but of breadth and depth. What if travel or a life is assessed by a depthometer where the determination is not linear, but submersive? As walkers, we see the road ahead, yes, 
but we also may see the surround to the right and to the left. And we may remember what now lies behind, perhaps even imagining what lies beneath, and maybe even a halt to peer up at what spreads out on high. How often does a wayfarer consider entering a center place, an ever enlarging sphere, an orb of growing experiences, spreading out 360 cubic degrees? Oh, to dream the land we roam and thereby discover it through the dimension we call sleep. In this way, he's distinguishing himself from other travelers by a deep travel and experience of America. And this is um, a follow-up theme of William Least Heat Moons, which he embarked on for, or introduced first in Prairie Earth, a deep map. But there is a second way in which uh, his travels intend to be distinct from fellow and former travelers and European writers. It has to do with his observation of the American experiment itself and is described in this passage <clears throat> uh, from the saloon or dining room of the Narwhale while he was yet crossing the Atlantic. Yesternight at supper in the saloon, whilst Captain Finn was engaged elsewhere, I brought up conditions in steerage, only to be interrupted by a husband of the gilded coterie, who said my topic was unseemly in the company of ladies. A woman, not related to them, said sharply, Let our physician speak. As I resumed, our table emptied of all except six of us. How deplorable those who could ameliorate life in steerage choose to remain ignorant of conditions only inches of oak planking beneath them. Upper deck passengers smell those below, but few will engage them. If I put my stethoscope to the thorax of a member of the cabinocracy, I would hear naught but the feeblest pit-pat of a wizened heart. Too slow, I have been to realize among immigrants to America there will also be those lacking any democratic impulse. Their American dream having no place for egalitarianism, and so, I fear, the seeds of oligarchy or plutocracy are surely aboard this ship, even among those in steerage. My foreboding is part of the great question about the survival of the American experiment. Leaving Buffalo, uh, we journey down the Ohio River, and we pass Cincinnati, we pass Louisville, and then we visit New Harmony, Indiana of all places, the site of two utopian experiences in American democracy, first by, led by George Rapp and then by Robert Dale Owen, uh, the Rappites and the, and the Harmonists. And a few pages are devoted in the book to the descriptions of New Harmony and its history, a place which many of us have visited. From New Harmony, a coach is taken overland to St. Louis, but first we stop off in Carmi, Illinois, at the Ratcliffe Inn, which still stands, uh, to change a wheel, and then on to Mount Vernon, Illinois, county seat of Jefferson County, concluding on the Illinois side at Illinoisville, or what is now East St. Louis. The journal becomes ever more observant of details, unlike de Tocqueville's, <clears throat> which is contrasted in this passage. De Tocqueville's judicious commentary and formidable education place his account above other interpretations of what is underway on this side of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, based upon his intellectual examinations here some 15 years ago, his words are not those of a traveler. He came not so much to explore a country as to examine a concept, American democracy. 
But his sober-sided text smells of a scholar's lamp rather than people's lives. In his pages, no women laugh or remonstrate for universal education. No expectorating men argue over horses. I never learn what Tocqueville ate for supper, whether his mattress had fleas, whether he noticed the distinctive sense of American forests. I hear him speak of capital punishment, but I do not see a thief or a noose. I read of wealth, but there is no clink of gold eagles. He writes of slavery, but not of an enslaved woman floating face down in Baltimore Harbor. His roads are without dust, his rivers without water, and his tavern floors have no spilled beer or cigar butts. Once in St. Louis, Deems meets up by a wonder his own mother, from whom he has been separated since living on the plantation in Loudoun County, Virginia. While there, he also, through the great tact and diplomacy of Dr. Trennett, delivers a speech as the first native African American to do so at the medical school on the benefits of education and especially education and medical sciences for the black people of America. It is around this point in the book that the second journal begins and records the longer trip to the what is called the American West via the Missouri River and then overland um, to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and from there through the Nebraska Territory and into what is now Central North Dakota. It is a 4,000 mile journey, not counting the crossing of the Atlantic, from America's eastern shore to, as it quote, as is described, as Dr. Trina describes after trading his compass and his telescope to Native Americans, somewhere northwest of the center of the nation. Through this 335 page travelogue of least heat moons, invented neo-Victorian voice, and vocabulary, which will require a dictionary, by the way, and enjoyably so, and his penchant for alliterative comparisons and contrasts, we as reader travelers discover how we as a people began, where we have come from, how we have come to where we are, and where we may or could be going, for better or for worse. This happens through the brilliant and ingenious device of a voice of an English physician invented by Lee Steep Moon, 1848. We experience the distinct elements of our history through this novel as many distinct elements as there are chemicals in the doctor's old medical bag. The cotton gin, the paddle and steamboat, Erie Canal, National Road, distrustful treaties made with Native Americans, the slave economy and its justifications, the words of our founders, the expedition of Lewis and Clark, frontier camp revival meetings, snake oil doctors, the Cahokia Mounds, the Oregon Trail, the Great Plains, prairie fires, and buffalo stampedes, our early cities, our early architecture, our early ways of speaking and relating, and the centers of our higher learning. In this novel we also meet who are our forebears. We meet immigrants of all classes and nationalities. There are tormented and tortured slaves. There are those who have suffered physical agony. There are dislocated Native Americans. There's one hell-bent bounty hunter of runaway slaves who pursues Dr. Trennan and Deems for about three-fourths of the way through the book. There are the settlers on the American continent in all locations, both urban and rural, their work, their land, their language. They, we meet in this book numerous roamers and roustabouts and in one scene in the Allegheny Mountains, 
we enter a scene that is taken right out of Alfred Hitchcock's movie Psycho. We meet patients of bizarre conditions and how a doctor in 1848 with a medical bag treats them. We meet a doctor along the way who invents a non-addictive painkiller but then is shunned by the drug pushing companies because they will not have perfect permanent patients due to addictions. Does that sound familiar? Through this we also meet various native various tribes of Native Americans and one old warrior who turns into a sachem in the end of his life, a wise man, something of a philosopher, as he frequently explains after giving his theory, or so the theory goes, who turns out to be close to the end of his life before meeting his own good day for dying, a life-saving hero of our protagonists. One of the ways that Least Heat Moon is, is ingenious in connecting 1848 to virtually the headlines of today is to connect not only experiences that transcend decades and centuries of our nation's life, but also to use its language to refer to the basic elements um, of, of our living together both as citizens and as partners. <clears throat> One day on the Narwhal, after Zofia, yet to become Sophie, and Dr. Trennett had become colleagues and more affectionately acquainted, <clears throat> Dr. Trennett learned more of her. <clears throat> Over the past year, the children on board introduced Zofia to the poems of Edgar Allan Poe, Peter Parley's Tales About America, and Irving's Sketchbook. In her emigrant's bundle of possessions, she carries a pamphlet containing the Declaration of Independence. With some pride and from memory, she quoted in her sweet accent, Behold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. I applauded. So she added, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Until she recited that sentence, I had never really heard the beauty and the power in those plain words. She said, These ideas are so noble. They made me want to go to a land where that is the way people live. Before deboarding in Baltimore Harbor, Dr. Trennett and Zofia helped arrange the inland travel and passage of the poor folks to their eventual destinations, since they had to disembark in Baltimore instead of New York as originally planned. To that end, Dr. Trennett pledged and donated an entire large sum of money, which had been unexpectedly given to him by Captain Finn out of gratitude for delivering the entire passage of the ship into Baltimore Harbor and through customs without illnesses or delay. Zofia sees his character and out of her own affection and acknowledging in a modest way his for her before they separate and go their ways, pledges her affection with these words. Arrangements were made for a Mennonite council to administer the money I gave them and I delivered the cough syrup to Herr Schiller explaining to retain it for use only when passing through the quarantine. As we dispersed, Zofia, I almost wrote here, my Zofia, who had interpreted so winningly this transaction, came up to me to quote, We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, 
and our sacred honor. And she took my hand and said, In America, now I am Sophie. It never occurred to me until reading that passage as described by Lee Steep Moon through Dr. Trenet and Zofia that marriage and love can be expressed in the same language as faithful citizenship. And so in this wonderful book, we experience many states, terror, disease and death, squalor, affection, bigotry, ingenuity and kindness and charity, the delight in those who live freely, a kind of American joie de vivre, wisdom and common sense, hatred, agony over social inequities. And we finally, toward the end, somewhere northwest of the center of our nation, the vast vistas that through all of his writing Least Heat Moon seems to capture with an almost cinematic eye. We experience the thanksgiving and the relief of all travelers who arrive at a planned destination, as well as the expectancy and the consummation of love, of love long hoped for. These interstates and the many literal states and territories as defined by lines on our nation's map through its history, are but an incomplete account of our developing story, both of readers as readers of this book, O oh America, Discovery in a New Land, and as citizens in 2021 of our nation, O oh America. Thank you for joining us today and look forward to the next Brown book, Bag and Books uh, review. Have a good day.